It's a pleasure to come back here again. It's been a long time. This is the third time that I've actually been inside a building since COVID started. Mm. I'm very fortunate as an Aboriginal person to love being in the outdoors and having the opportunity to be out there and working on country. My name is Dave Wandon and I'm an elder of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Tribal Land Council. On whose land you are gathered today? You are gathered on the land of my father's country. But of course it's my country today and it will belong to my children and my grandchildren and of course the children not yet born. And on that note, I pay my respects to my ancestors, my elders, both past and present, and our young people, which will become our future elders. For the knowledge that they have been able to pass down to me, that I can pass to my children and my grandchildren, and now my great-grandchildren, just turned four. Um, and I pay my respects to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are gathered with us today, to their ancestors and elders, and there's two in the room that I've worked with fairly closely over the last 10 years. And I'm paying my respects to them and their elders and their communities for being able to being allowed to walk their country and learn from them and vice versa. And we've actually discovered that the knowledge gaps we thought we had are not as broad as what we thought they were. We all have different gaps within our communities, but when we start communicating together, which we have been or I have been over the last 10 years, we find that the, there's so much collective knowledge. It's very much a basic principle, a guiding principle of what our culture really means. And that's why the welcome to country is so important. Because there are rules, not just when you go into someone's house, but there are rules when you walk on country. And we're here, you know, this is academia. I'm not an academic, but I am a scientist. But that's recognised by my mob. Because we are the first scientists of this country. We have been collecting data for more than 70,000 years. As we went out and gathered our daily resources that we needed, we were out there under our totemic system. And I'll give you an example. Uh, mine is the ring-tailed possum, but my grandson is the, uh, the powerful owl. You know, you think that should put us as loggerheads, because he's a threat to my community, to my totem. But in actual fact, it only reinforces and strengthens our bond, that it strengthens my responsibility to my totem that I must make sure that I create an environment that supports and enhances a thriving population of the ringtail, knowing that they will be predated by the powerful owl. And of course, as my grandson grows up, he'll realise what the powerful owl needs. And so his responsibility will be to make sure that it has the habitat that it needs to survive, not just the ringtail possums, but everything else it needs for nesting material, the right type of trees and all those kind of, and that's why we have a totemic system. That's our connection to country. Because it's only by understanding country can you actually start to understand human behaviour and your community. Humans are the most complicated people in the world, the com complicated part of this world system that we've got. So to understand your community, learning from the plants and the animals and the water and the soils and the trees and the birds and the mammals and the marsupials and everything else that connects it all together gives you the strength that when you go through your initiation and you become a part of your community, that every time you become up against adversity, you can go back to what you've learnt from country and you can apply those principles to human behaviour. In that way, you encourage change, you encourage respect. And it's not because I want it, it's because I'm saying this is what my animal needs. And other people say that's my bird and that's my fish. And it's not that I'm against you, but what you're doing is you're harming not me, you're harming my totem. And amongst Aboriginal people, we respect that as we walk country. We don't talk on other people's country unless we're invited to. Um, and people say, what is a welcome to country? Um, and how does it work in today's society? But if you think about it, you all do a welcome to country in your own home pretty much every day, except you think of your home as having a roof. Our home has a roof, but it's the sky. And the walls are our boundaries. And anybody who comes into our home, we need to welcome them for many, many reasons. But primarily, we need to know who they are, we need to know what they're there for, and how long they're going to be for. So as they come into our country, if I was to go down and visit Damien, you know, he would say, OK, I've got Uncle Dave coming down, I need to put up, um, you know, find a spare room in my house or put him up in a motel, make sure that he's fed, show him where the good water is, maybe the best pub, who knows. Um, yeah, all these things that you do when you welcome people into your house, the first thing you do, you get a knock on the door, you open it, 
Oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, you know the person. Come in. The first thing you do is offer them a cup of tea, just like when we all walked in here this morning. Our welcome has been the same for thousands and thousands of years, but your welcome is the same too. Just We approach it differently. But the rules are the same. Once someone enters your house, you take on the responsibility of caring for them. And under our law, Bunjil, our creator spirit, it's not just people coming onto country, it's everything that's in country that he gave us responsibility to care for. And for the you know, 170 years here in Victoria, we haven't been able to do that. And of course, now we're at that, this critical mass. And it's not all doom and gloom, but it's gonna be a long road to recovery. But if we go back to remembering from my creator spirit, Bunjil, who gave us all the laws of the land and our responsibilities, he gave us first law, and that is, you must respect your mother. Not only your physical mother that you are born from, who is the first person that you see as you enter the world, the first person you are connected to, who feeds you, clothes you, keeps you warm when it's cold, cools you down when it's hot, looks after you when you are sick, provides shelter and food. And as our physical mother grows older, and we grow older, and she struggles in her, in her old age, to do what she used to do. We return that favour to our physical mother. But the other side of the coin, the other 50%, is we must also respect the spirit of our mother as we do our physical mother. And of course for us, our, physical mother, our spiritual mother is the land on which we live and work and play and rely on for our survival. And the land is old. And she has cared for our, our people for many, many thousands of years here in Australia because we did respect her and we cared for her, and we listened to what she tells us. We don't have a language, everybody knows that, it's not written down, but believe it or not, the language is out there. But only Aboriginal people can read it, because the language is there in the land. And that's what we call reading country. And it's not something you can learn in a university. You need to walk with us. And that's always my message. Let's walk country together, so we can heal country together. And once we heal country together, we can all call ourselves Australians. But best of all, when you heal country, you heal people and they are healthy. Healthy country means healthy people. That's why we have survived for so long, by keeping country healthy. And we adapted to country as we listened to the messages that the land was telling us. We didn't say you know, in the climate change that we know that our ancestors went through here in Australia, many ice ages the lakes drying out, the seas rising. You know, my dad tells the joke, you know, we don't go over and visit, we haven't visited the Tasmanian Aboriginals for many thousands of years. And we haven't done that since the back road got flooded. <laughs> you know, because you know, that's what we now call Bass Strait. And I used to think it was a joke, but I know that going up far north, uh, uh, past Cairns and meeting all the mobs up there as part of my work as a fire elder, uh, and listening to their stories, and they have those same stories about walking out to those islands. They remember when they were connected to the landmass. And that's where the new science that has been studied here for the last 200 years, but our science as well, can work together and we'll come up with a solution. There is no us and them, you and I. We are together because I know that we have been at loggerheads and that was just through colonisation. Things are changing. Reconciliation is a wonderful movement. It's got a long way to go. But I think when we all sit at home and we listen to the news and we read our papers, whether you're a scientist or you're a student at primary school, we all have the same goals. We want to leave something behind better, not just for our grandchildren, which we physically see in our great-grandchildren, but for those children that are not yet born. Make sure that we hand something back to them that's better than what we found it. Now, we'll never get it back to what it was 200 years ago in Australia. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't aim for those goals. But understanding that in the 200 years, without colonisation, the landscape was changing and is changing. And it's how we monitor those changes in the remnant areas that we've got left. And that's why I love um, you know, doing archaeology and finding our huge scatter sites and the work that's been done down at Gundichamara and Budgebeam, our eel traps in the Yarra, are such a mine of information that science can actually le learn from. And I'm amazed now that me, with a year 10 education, that I do work with a lot of scientists. Universities are calling me and other Aboriginal people in to say, what do you think about this? <laughs> and they're listening now. If we had to listen 200 years ago and we had a cared for country, 
and we had healthy country, we would not have had COVID. My take on COVID, well, for me, it was a great time for me. It gave me a chance to relax. Instead of working 10 days a week, I'm now back to eight days a week because uh, that's the demand on our time and we'll be talking about that later on. You know, now we're being asked to contribute and we want to contribute but you want too much all at once. There's a lot of relearning we have to do. There's a lot of testing we have to do. And, but I'm lucky to have the opportunity on my little 200 acres of land to do those demonstrations, to show how you can marry conservation with an economic farm, how you can diversify your farm, improve your farm, not by putting more fertilisers and getting bigger machinery, but by micromanaging it. And that's what we did. We didn't wait for the disasters to happen. We went out every day. We observed what we did. And in the afternoon, we went back to our elders, just like a research student goes back to their lecture. They go out in the field, collect data. And they ask, what's the solution? And the lecturer, the professor or the elder would help talk you through it, through that collective memory. And you would come up with a solution. And you would go out the next day and you, you would apply that solution because we had time. We didn't have to work 50 hours a week. We only work four hours a day for everything that we needed. Wouldn't we all like to go back to that? The rest of the time was about caring for country. And that's the commitment, not just us as scientists or Aboriginal people, but humanity has to make. We have to find the time to heal country. There are too many people out there who think it's the government's job. But it's not just the government's job. It's not just my job and my people's job. It's not just the scientist's job. It's only, as I keep saying, we need to walk country together, to learn from country together, so we can work out the best solutions. And I believe we do have the capacity to do that. Well, Minjika, Wurundjeri, Biak, welcome to Wurundjeri country, and thank you.